part in the interruption, but I'm Pablo Torre, and Wilbon is out today, and he is not the only thing that's out, actually. And Tony Kornheiser, so is my internet. FaceTime over an <laughs> iPhone, baby, I'm serious. Pablo, I'm looking into something that is the size of a dinner roll. And if, if we pull this show off, I don't think we need all the big stuff anymore. I mean, it's really, it's it so does small. Kind of feel, it does kind of feel like we're sending you into space somehow. I feel like I'm in the control room here. We're just watching you float yeah. around, navigating an uncertain territory. Yeah, it's Apollo 13. Good thing I've seen that movie 10 times. Welcome to PTI, yeah, boys well, and girls. Thanks. Wilbon apparently needed the day off to recover from the weekend, so I am joined by our great friend with the chief branding, Mr. Pablo Torre. Technology today, just A plus Boy, across that's, the board. That's really weak. And we begin today with the Mets trading Max Scherzer to the Texas Rangers for Luis Angel Acuna, Ronald's younger brother. Scherzer expressed unhappiness the other day when the Mets traded reliever David Robertson. With Scherzer agreeing to go to Texas, Justin Verlander's name comes up with possible trade partners, the Dodgers and Astros, with whom Verlander won a World Series last year. Pablo, what does this tell you about the Mets, the Rangers, and Scherzer? Tony, I'll start with the Mets here because I warned you about this when I was doing the show with you last Thursday. Your precious warrior god, Max Scherzer, should yeah. have been traded, yeah. has been traded, because when it, when it comes to the Mets, Tony, right, Steve Cohen there owner is one of the 30 richest men in America. It turns out that when you have Steve Cohen money, selling is a lot easier as well. Not just buying, selling, because the Mets are going to pay about $36 million of Scherzer's contract to get a top five prospect from in Acuna, as you said, from a top 10 farm system. Yeah. And so this is an example of largesse funding a forward thinking approach. Scherzer is not the guy that you love anymore. His slider gets hit, his velocity's down, all of that is so. And for the Mets, what do they have left for this season except to play for the next? It makes total sense for them. Yeah, so anyone who's ever seen me on this show knows that Scherzer is my favorite player, the warrior god. I understand what happened here. I also understand he has nine wins this year. He's nine and four. His ERA is up. But what this tells me about the Rangers is that they are trying to win a World Series. I mean, they're a first-place yes. team at the moment. I believe they have scored more runs per game than any other team in baseball. And what they need mm -hmm. is starting pitching because Jacob deGrom is out with Tommy John and Nathan Avoldi has just gone to the IL. Now, I understand, and you can wrap Scherzer all you want. I I'll concede a, a certain amount of this, that he has had bad postseasons the last two times. But he's always still Max Scherzer. You hand him the ball with confidence because he's Max Scherzer. What this tells me about the Mets is they understand they're not going to win, which is why Verlander's name is coming up now. Mm -hmm. Scherzer, the last time out, beat the Nats when seven innings gave up one earned and struck out seven. Yesterday, I believe, Verlander also beat the Nats, went five and a third and gave up one run. So maybe the ticket to being traded is to beat the Nats. So uh, it's a risky thing, Pablo. You hire a 39-year-old and a 40-year-old, and you give them each $43 million. If you don't win now, you can't wait. You can't. So I get no. it. But Max Scherzer, he's going to go to the Hall of Fame now. And this is so odd to me. Having pitched for six different teams, that's highly unusual, if not completely unprecedented, right? Well, he tried to do this very thing that the Rangers are hiring him to do with the Dodgers, and he almost did it, right? It didn't go exactly the way that Max Scherzer's uh, worshippers, like yourself, would have hoped, even if he wasn't with your Nats right. at that point. That's right. But this is what he does. He's a hired arm who has the experience, and you have to think that his heart rate slows when others speed up. And so when we talk about would you players give him changing the ball? teams, Pablo, Tony. If you were in a playoff game, if you were in a playoff game, would you hand him the ball? Would you hand Verlander I, the ball? Both of them. You would. I, you I, would. I would. I would because I believe there's something different about that spotlight. I think the stage creates a pressure that people wilt under. And Scherzer, even if he's getting hit, by the way, the league has been hitting home runs off of Max Scherzer at a rate that is higher than anybody yes. else in baseball. Even still, I believe yes. that his experience in yes. the postseason yes. means that I would like to try it out if I'm the Rangers still. Yeah. But 
if we're going to talk about players changing teams, we should talk about Aaron Rodgers because he is now going back at Sean Payton, Tony. Last week, we talked about this one, too. The Broncos' new head coach told USA Today that Nathaniel Hackett's stint with the franchise last season with the Broncos represented one of the worst coaching jobs in the history of the NFL. That was his quote. And so Rodgers has responded with his own. He's called Sean Payton insecure. He's added, quote, I think it was way out of line, inappropriate, and I think he needs to keep my coach's names out of his mouth, end quote. So, Tony, what do you make of Rodgers' response to Sean Payton here? This is quintessential Aaron Rodgers. He likes nothing more than to stir it up. He has found a perfect and easy villain in Sean Payton. He has found his offensive coordinator at the Jets, who was his offensive coordinator in Green Bay as well, a hero that he can stand by in Nathaniel Hackett. This is, this is a fight for honor and glory by Aaron Rodgers. And let me go back over that quote for a second, which is he needs to keep my coach's names out of his mouth. Isn't that what yep. Will Smith said just before he slapped <laughs> Chris Rock in the face at the Oscars? Let me just say this. This game that everybody's going to want to see is a 425 Sunday game on Sunday, October 8th, I believe. We it's try. probably a CBS game. If I was NBC, I would try like hell to flip to this game to and, and put this on Sunday night because this is going to be the most anticipated game in the first half of the season. And, and now, Tony, the reason it reaches that height is because this is now an Aaron Rodgers story. And Aaron Rodgers should recognize that Sean Payton is merely merely doing his own research here into this topic. And I think it's unfortunate that political correctness, PC culture, has come down upon a person exercising their free speech. That is what Sean Payton is doing. I would like to encourage Sean Payton to put as many names into his mouth as he could possibly hold at the same time. Because I, like you, am hungry for drama at a time of the year when we're kind of <laughs> running thin on it. So for that yeah. reason, Tony, I believe that Aaron Rodgers is doing his best to defend a guy who is indefensible. Nathaniel Hackett, if you go down to that that list of quotes that he gave, he called him a great family man. He said he makes things fun for him. He loves playing for him. Arguably his favorite coach in the NFL his whole career. I did not hear a defense of Nathaniel Hackett being good at coaching football. That would be my main concern if I am the Jets. I have not heard a, a plausible defense that this guy is actually going to make my team better. Let me, go, let me go back just for a second to Sean Payton, who knew exactly what he was saying and knew that this was going to be the reaction. Sean Payton doesn't care if Aaron Rodgers hates him or Nathaniel Hackett hates him or Robert Sala hates him or anybody in the Jets hates him. That is aimed, as you well know, at one guy, Russell Wilson. That says mm -hmm. to Russell Wilson, look, you stunk last year, but it wasn't your fault. It's Hackett's fault. And I've got your back. He, that is the only person he's aimed at. So for him as well, it is a fight for honor and glory. And it's yes. cool drama. We move now to the Indianapolis Colts disgruntled running back, Jonathan Taylor. He wants to be paid more than the Colts want to give him. Now the Colts are reportedly considering placing Taylor on the non-football injury list so they don't have to pay him a dime. Taylor is at camp, but he is not participating. Pablo, how does the situation between Taylor and the Colts sound to you? It sounds like a guy desperate to wring leverage out of a stone, and he's finding nothing. Jonathan Taylor had one agent. That approach didn't work. Diplomacy, he got another one recently. He tries to come out and demand a trade, make things messier, in tune with Jim Irsay, who is, yes, an occasionally unhinged billionaire who's not a lot of fun to work for. If you're Jonathan Taylor, I grant him that. But the problem with wringing leverage out of the stone, Tony, as we well know, is that there isn't any to get. He is a guy. I have Jonathan Taylor no. like so many Americans across this country. I have him on my fantasy team. It is a keeper league. The question I face is the question the Colts face. What do you think of a guy whose yards per carry, whose EPA per play has decreased as he faces more light, or sorry, fewer light boxes than he has in his whole career and also got hurt last season? Jonathan Taylor is fantastic. He's also not reliable right now. So it's a bad time to demand a trade on a bunch of different levels. I mean, I think the trade that suggests itself is obvious. You trade Jonathan Taylor for Saquon Barkley. You swap one disgruntled <laughs> running back who's not getting paid enough for another person. But Jimmy Ursay says that he's not going to trade him. I will say this, and I know you will agree. If this was the NBA, Jonathan Taylor would be traded in 24 hours to a team that he wants to be traded for. And I can't yeah, believe that I'm the only one who connects the dots between Jimmy Ursay and all the failures of the Colts lately. All the quarterbacks mm. that haven't worked out, 
All the coaches that haven't worked out, even That's though fair. it was a spectacular move to have Jeff Saturday, and that <laughs> didn't work out. And the Jonathan Taylor thing right now, it's not going to work out. I mean, this, you know, Jimmy Ursay is center stage all the time, and things don't work out there. I don't think you get anything out of Jonathan Taylor by threatening not to pay him at all. That doesn't no. seem the way to go to me. Yeah, needless aggravation, I would say, from Jim Ursay to Jonathan Taylor. Jim Ursay's quote that had been reported is wild. It's talking about how if Jim Ursay died and Jonathan Taylor was out of the league, no one would miss us. The NFL rolls on. I guess that is literally factually accurate in the grand sweep of human history. But when you're dealing with an employee who matters, the one thing you can pay Jonathan Taylor, Tony, if not money, is respect. And I get why Jonathan Taylor yeah. is furious that he's not getting that kind of currency. I would love to make the case that Jonathan Taylor is critical to the Colts' success. But with him last year, they were 4-12-1. They stunk Correct. anyway. And now they have a new coach who's never coached before as a head coach. And they have a rookie quarterback, right, Anthony Richardson? And it, it mm -hmm. just feels like a sinkhole over there. Let's take a break. Coming up, will the United States women advance out of the group stage tonight? And will a memo from the NBA impact Damian Lillard's chances of ending up on the Miami Heat. I can still see you on this tiny little phone. I can see you. I don't yeah. think this is going to work for the whole show. <laughs> I, 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 I don't. I expect you to start floating around, so. just sort of like a cosmonaut. Yeah, <laughs> at, at any point oh, now. Yeah. But it's working, Tony. If you're just joining us, I'm hosting over an iPhone. Look how big my hands are. <laughs> Kenny Pickett's jealous. Let's see what's first Mail here. Time. I need glasses. Uh. Percentage-wise, how confident are you that the U.S. women will advance out of the group stage? Oh, Tony, I'm giving this about a 90%, a 90% flat, or as it was known in my household, a B+. Plus. I say this because I expect the United States to dominate Portugal when it comes to the historical record, right? They're 10-0 against them. They've scored a zillion goals. They're playing at 3 a.m. All of this is so. But Portugal just beat, or the, no, it was Portugal that just lost to the Netherlands 1-0, right? So I believe that in that case, yes. we're looking at a yes. situation, Tony, where the food chain of this group is a little dicey. I don't know if this is the U.S. Women's National Team that I grew up watching anymore. Let me go back on something. Did you say that a 95 grade was a B-plus in your household? A 95 I mean, an a plus grade is really was, this kid's a getting, is a B. No, this kid is getting a region scholarship. He's going to state school for free. <laughs> that was in my, how I know my you're household, because I didn't American. get that many 95s. Yeah. Okay, this is, is that the only way you could tell? That's fabulous. Um, <laughs> so... This is a prop, approximately 85% for me. First of all, we always get out of the group stage. We, we always do. And if I understand this correctly, if we either tie or beat Portugal tonight, we are going to advance. We are ranked first in the world. They are ranked 21st in the world. So unless they can somehow get Cristiano Ronaldo out there, I think we got a really good chance. You talked about historically what goes on. We have outscored them in 10 games that we won each one, 39 nothing. They've had no <laughs> goals, none against us. So I think that my 85% is conservative, and your 95% may be conservative as well. Let me go to the next one, Mail okay? Like an F in my household. Yeah. What, woo, what does the NBA's memo do to Damian Lillard's chances of ending up on the heat? Tony, this is just a reminder of the way the NBA really works. They just don't want you to talk about Fight Club. This is all this is. They send memos a lot. You know, don't tamper, don't tank, do all. It's all to remind you, if you're going to do the thing that we cannot stop you from doing, just don't make us look stupid for having to enforce the rules against it. They know this is not going to do much. The message is already out there. Dame Lillard wants to go to Miami and nowhere else. 
But the reality is, how do you police this if they're just going to do this in a back channel instead of on Front Street? The problem was they did it in public. That's the only reason they're sending this memo out in the first place. Do you want to explain the memo? What they basically said is, if Damian Lillard gets traded anywhere else, we fully expect 100% effort from him yes, all the he time. Yes, can't threaten to sit I out. Think, right. I think what this does is ensure that he goes to Miami. This is posing <laughs> on the part of the NBA front office. They're saying, look what we can do. We have to do this. But please understand the subtext here. Let him be traded to Miami so this thing works out. Let's be done with this thing. Damian Lillard's agent was 100% correct in saying to other teams, don't trade for him. He doesn't want to play for you. Damian Lillard's agent is supposed to serve his client. And Damian Lillard wants to play for Miami. I think this ensures he's going to do it. And when the trade is made, the commissioner is just going to wave and smile and say, this is the right thing. We could have been tough here, but we don't have to be tough. They, they want him in Miami, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think. Yeah. I think. Enough I think email. So. Let's take one last break, but still to come. What's wrong with Justin Thomas? Really? You got time? You got 15 minutes on this show? And the Angels. The Angels, Tony, they're getting Shohei Otani a little more help. What, 75% was an F when you were growing up? Oh, that wow. was... Wow. Don't even come home. Yeah. Really? We came to this country for a 75? Really? That's what I would have heard. I never did, because I never got wow. a 75. Tonight on SportsCenter at 6 Eastern, will Jonathan Taylor wear a Colts uniform this season? We are live from Indianapolis with the latest. Plus, three days from the start of the NFL preseason, what will Aaron Rodgers' impact be on the young New York Jets? And 24 hours from the MLB trade deadline, who will make a move that will shake up the pennant races? SportsCenter, 6 Eastern on ESPN. Happy time, people. Happy 41st birthday to Marcus Ware. The nine-time Pro Bowl pass rusher for the Cowboys and Broncos will be inducted into the Hall of Fame this coming month and presented by Jerry Jones. Ware was first-team All-Pro four times, second-team All-Pro three times. His career total of 138 and a half sacks ranks ninth on the official career sack list. Ware was drafted by Dallas 11th overall in 2005 out of Troy State, and he started every game as a rookie leading Dallas in sacks for the first of eight times there. He led the NFL twice in sacks. Ware went to the Broncos after the Cowboys released him in 2014 in time for their 2015 season Super Bowl win over Carolina, in which Ware had two sacks and four quarterback hits. He was a monster in that Super Bowl, Tony, and he was a monster for the 15 years before the Cowboys caught him in 2015. He was the best player in the franchise for that span. And by the way, when it happened, I was surprised because generally the Cowboys like keeping around aging stars, but Jerry Jones cut him. It was a prudent financial move and no love was lost. As you say, Jerry Jones is the guy he credits for bringing him into the That's franchise. Right. He said Bill Parcells didn't want him. Jerry did. Yeah. And Jerry's going to present him at the Hall of Fame. Happy anniversary, Dick Allen. This is posthumous, but on this day 51 years ago, when Allen was with the White Sox, he hit two inside the park home runs against a young Burt Blylevin. This was the year Allen won the American League MVP, eight years after being the National League Rookie of the Year in Philadelphia. Allen had a difficult ride in Philadelphia, once famously using his shoe to spell out boo in the first base dirt. <laughs> Allen was a seven-time All-Star and has arguably Hall of Fame credentials. Ironically, the next and last time a player hit two inside the park homers in the same game was Greg Gagne of the Twins in 1986, and the pitcher benefiting was then 35-year-old Burt Blylevin. I love anybody who chooses the protest in the way that you would if you found, like, some drying cement. Love putting boo into the dirt like that. The second thing, though, Tony, is that I was not around, maybe shocked to hear this, from 1965 to 1974, but looking at his numbers, Dick Allen was the best slugger in baseball. Like, OPS Plus, yeah. the stat that you use to advanced metric your way to consensus. Dick Allen's the guy in that span, which is also incredible. 
Happy trails, Sony Michelle, the two-time Super Bowl champion running back, once with the Patriots, once with the Rams, is retiring from the NFL after just five years. Michelle, 28, told Rams coach Sean McVay he was listening to his body. Michelle was originally drafted by the Patriots out of Georgia. In the Super Bowl, where the Patriots beat the Rams, Michelle had 94 yards rushing and the only touchdown in the game. In his season with the Rams, when they beat Cincinnati in the Super Bowl, Michelle had 845 yards rushing and four touchdowns. Michelle spent last season with the Chargers, and he had returned to the Rams. I feel like I need to apologize on behalf of the show to every running back out there. We're not just trying to rub it in here. It just is the case that Sony Michelle happened to be just as good in the Super Bowl as like an actual star running back would be. I apologize for the rookie wage scale and all of the economic forces conspiring against you. I promise you that we are not one of them. Just stating the facts here. 28 years old, five seasons out. And yeah. all that. You don't expect that. You don't expect that. All right, we're running out of show when we go to the big finish. The Angels traded with the Rockies for C.J. Crone and Randall Gritchick. Is that significant? It is because they're all in on Shohei Otani. They're all in on giving America, the world, Shohei Otani in the postseason for the first time a worthy cause. Justin Thomas has now missed the cut in five of his last seven events, Tony. Is that a big deal? It's a very big deal. He's a two-time major champ. He's won two different PGAs. And he may need a complete makeover. He's very popular with crowds and with other players. This is surprising. The Yankees lost again, striking out 18 times. Luis Severino says he feels like the worst pitcher in the league. How are you feeling? I'm feeling like a guy who roots for the worst pitcher in the league. The guy used to be an all-star, and now he's either hurt or tipping pitches or both. It's terrible. Katie Ledecky, meanwhile, won the 800 free at the Worlds. Are you impressed? She now has more gold medals, individual gold medals at the World Championships than even Michael Phelps. She's the greatest female swimmer yeah. of all time, and she grew up two miles from where I'm sitting. Last one, <laughs> Terrence Crawford dominated Errol Spence Jr. in a battle of welterweights. Your thoughts? Crawford is the best fighter in the world. Would love to put him in a time machine and have him fight Manny Pacquiao. Would have been an all-timer. We're out of time. We will try and do better the next time, not on this iPhone. I'm Tony Kornheiser. <laughs> And I'm Pablo Torre. We're going to be off tomorrow for the MLB trade deadline coverage. So you knuckleheads can get the PTI podcast on the ESPN app, Apple Podcasts. Also, www.pablo.show is a thing I made. But for now, here's Sports Center. <laughs>